Okay, folks. Um, so we are going to be discussing now um, in, again, a whirlwind sort of capacity, um, the use of location and space within our models, um, within agent-based and hybrid models, okay? Um, and we're going to very quickly go through uh, a set of different sort of ways in which we can uh, you know, we can represent space and uh, a set of uh, common uh, types of support that any logic offers um, uh, for this. And uh, to that end, um, I'm going to be posting some more videos. So you have a, a couple ones that, and apologies, there's there's so much going on. I haven't had a chance to post the videos from this morning, nor some of these um, uh, these slides. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll seek to do that tonight. But the, the basic deal is um, when it comes to spatially explicit models, uh, we... Oh, thank you. Yeah, we we have a uh, a set of different ways of of representing such models. And uh, is that is that the right sc screen? Yes. That's sure. Okay. Great. Um, broadly, we have if if we think about it at a technical level, we have some depictions of space that are typically rather abstract. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit more geographically situated where we have patches. And that's what we call a discrete space, okay? Um, and here we divide space up into a set of grid cells. And those grid cells uh, operate with reference to one another. So what goes on in one grid cell is influenced commonly by its neighbors. Um, and uh, there's a there's a model that this is that for uh, some scenarios inspired by West Nile virus. It's a classic one that, that goes back to uh, 1970s, uh, the so-called game of life, which is not health related despite what you might think is a reference to life sciences, but is, is more of a kind of five piece model. Um, and uh, there's another one, which um, uh, which involves mobility called the shoveling segregation model that we'll be, we're talking about shortly when it comes to mobility. Now, beyond these, um, we have uh, a set of models where there are, um, embeddedness in continuous space. By continuous space, I'm, I'm speaking of space that could be geographic, um, but needn't always be geographic. It, it could be more, more stylized. Um, and we saw one of those yesterday. In fact, we built one, right, where we had income used to shape people's location in the model. Remember that? They're, they're horizontal location, their X location was given by right? And that led to crowding in the model. And that then induced as an emergent property disparities in the burden of infection, right? So we had we have that emergent nonlinear graph, right? Where we had more occurrences, like people who were in lower income areas, in large part because of the crowding, really, you know, can't think of any other factor, really, um, because it didn't influence any other factor, either directly or indirectly through the income, it led to crowding and it led to much, it led to higher levels uh, of numbers of infection compared to people with, um, with low, or with higher income. Um, uh, but some of these models, uh, are are also um, ones where the 
locations are not dictated by something like income. I think we'll open up this childhood infectious disease model. Um, and I'm going to seek to, to find that location for you. So if we can't find it, we'll, we'll bear with it. But um, uh, I believe it's in the general, any, any logic, yes, here we go. Um, so it's childhood diabetes. Can you still see my screen, Jenna? Yeah. Okay. Uh, exploratory model. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, did I, did I, uh, mess that up with, uh, ah, it's, it's childhood infectious disease. There's a childhood diabetes exploratory model, but then there's a childhood infectious disease model. You can download that. Okay. Um, and we can open it up. Uh, and we'll see here um, a person evolving uh, over time, it's kind of a life course model. So we track an open population with pregnancy, someone's uh, health state and, and infection state. And, you know, we're seeking to simulate things like uh, the spread in an unvaccinated population. Oh, okay. Looks like this this is an ancient model and it looks like it exhibits I see. So oh, that's interesting. Why does it need B cell? Um wait. It really doesn't. Okay. Um uh -huh. so, so so you can remove it as a dependency in it. Okay. Um yeah, so imports. Here, uh, that's that's really curious. I I'm not sure why that would have been there. Sometimes uh, auto complete if you if you auto complete uh, something from a library, it will automatically insert the import of that library. Okay, yeah. So okay, thanks, thanks, Wade. Yeah. So when we went to this model, we went to Maine and we scrolled down to Advanced Java. There was something. Kind of, so there's some crap there, some old stuff that is not needed, and I apologize for that. I, uh, oh, but uh, wait, it looks like okay, yeah, we're, it looks like we won't be able to. Um, hmm. well, that's the health economics. Oh, that's the health economics model. I'm sorry, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so we should be able to run this model thing, yes, thank you, Wade. That, that's that's interesting. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. So I think it's initializing the population on the model. Okay. And uh, here we have people in a network and we have people located um, uh, located in space. Um, uh, there's uh, births going on um, uh, over time and the babies are born in a location that uh, is close to the uh, close to the mother. There's a performed birth um, dynamics here, and they are placed linked to the mother and uh, placed in a location close to the mother. So this is a very stylized use of location, but it leads to kind of clustering of families in a in a um, open population with births and deaths and an evolution of that in a way that's also simulating spread of infection within that context. And you'll notice that as you'd expect for childhood infectious disease like chickenpox in the mid, um, mid 1900s or pertussis, the vast majority of people are immune, but new babies can be born in ways that end up um, exposing them to, uh, to infection. And so you have um, cumulative incidents, which capitalize on these new births, and which can lead to these outbreaks that occur periodically, um, and sort of spread um, infection within the susceptible um, folks in the population. And by um, uh, by restricting sort of the uh, the 
uh, the, the people that are um, displayed, I'm not sure if this is working, but we can we can focus on, for example, the um, uh, the younger folks, et cetera. In any case, the point is here, space is stylized, but we put new babies like this one right here is susceptible close to the mother. And, and over time, there's sort of a family structure captured spatially and the, the networks are close within the family and less so further out. And um, that provides some basis for sort of reasoning about childhood infectious disease. Um, so again, stylized in that case um, as a strategy. But I want to talk. Um, um, I want to talk a little bit more about GIS models. Okay, so there's a um, um, right. Um, there's a GIS food environment model, um, and I'd like to open that. That's actually of of greater interest yet. So to see this, we go to any logic eight examples in the GIS model of of note here is in the hybrid model folder, okay? And it's GIS, food and PA environment. And let me make sure I get the right one here. Um, here we go, um, uh, version six with adding supermarkets, but I think, I'm sorry, folks. Um, I think actually we do want, uh, um, we do actually want the one which is version seven here rather than, um, I see, I see, uh, yeah, yeah, with scatter plots. Yeah. So let's go that and, and now let's download that, okay? So this is gonna be a GIS model. And this model actually does include some mobility, but there's a set of resources here in the form of um, supermarkets that are geographically si situated and in the form of parks that are geographically situated in, it goes without saying, um, fixed location. Okay, so let's uh, let's go uh, open that up. Okay. And let's go to main here. And we're going to run this environment, okay, and we're going to observe a geographic space, for those who don't recognize it, this is Melbourne, Australia. Um, I think we built this model in Melbourne, uh, maybe for the group. Um, and uh, you can zoom in by using the mouse wheel if you happen to have it. The uh, uh, These uh, larger sort of uh, uh, vaguely vaguely um, sort of house-like structures or something. They're actually larger buildings. These are supermarkets. The green squares are parks and the, uh, uh, the uh, smaller green buildings are convenience stores. Um, and you'll see that there's individuals undergoing mobility within this space and uh, to make a long story short, and you'll find videos of me explaining this model, explicating this model in some detail, but if we, if we go zoom in on the model, what we'll find is that there's dynamics characterized um, with stock and flow and with state charts and with some decision-making with what are called action charts, which dictate sort of a, a decision tree structure. And here, um, we have people making decisions at two levels. One is to eat meals. Um, they have a certain number of convenience store meals in their fridge, so to speak. They have a certain number of supermarket meals. Um, sorry, these two. And then they decide what to eat at a given time. And when they need to procure food, if they're out of food, they engage in food seeking behavior and their decision whether to purchase convenience store food or supermarket food is based on a set of considerations. And those considerations involve the distance to the store and their preference for uh, the type of food um, that, they're, that they're seeking, okay? 
Um, so they, they have a probability of shopping wisely, which basically takes into account the distance um, and, uh, and then also the, uh, the preference for convenience store meals. So if they prefer, uh, this is Australia, so if they prefer meat pies or something, uh, <laughs> or um, there, there's various sundry um, Australian dishes uh, um, that I don't don't remember, but uh, that are uh, there's a thing called a floater or something, which is in Australia apparently not that healthy. So it'd be maybe like poutine in Canada or something. Um, in any case, they have a certain preference for convenience store meals that interplace with the distance. Make a long story short, and. Uh, within this context, they're going to decide where to get their next meals from. They purchase a larger number at the grocery store, fewer number at the convenience store. The convenience store is often much closer. And so they're they're making decisions. And those decisions over time and what they consume um, combined with their interactions with the parks and the ideas that the parks lead to energy consumption from recreational use of, of uh, uh, you know, green space. And uh, these individuals circulate, and over time, the energy in and the energy out from parks and from basal energy expenditure, just from expending it um, day to day, ends up shaping their weight, and uh, their weight evolves over time. So some individuals are uh, more gracile than others, and others exhibit, you know, um, uh, are carry carry more weight, and um, in this context, you can uh, go and uh, put in new supermarkets, for example, by double clicking on the map, and study how does that end up impacting the outcomes of the model. And some of those outcomes are illustrated up at the top. Um, so. Uh, for example, the fraction of meals in, uh, eaten at convenience stores versus uh, people's weights is shown there. Now, I have to apologize. I'm running this with a very small population. I should, in order to show anything half decent, I should probably do big population with walks or something like that. This, this will take, uh, take a bit longer, but it will uh, hopefully exhibit... Um, uh, a little bit more um, statistical significance in terms of its um, uh, accumulated dynamics. Now, you may notice there's some extra flashing going on here. Um, there was uh, just a, a little bit ago. Basically, it's getting routes to route people. So when they go from their home uh, to a supermarket or their home to a park or their home to a convenience store, it... Um, uh, actually, it's more convenience stores and, and supermarkets. It um, it it uh, takes some time to find the route. When we asked how the how distant they are from a park, um, uh, it uh, see the distance from home to nearest park. It also computes the distance, uh, or it also computes the distance using the routing. So it figures out basically how far it would be to to go on the roads to a park. Um, and you can use, you could in principle do it for walking, biking, or, or car-based use, vehicular use. Um, and uh, these uh, various graphs are going to summarize, they're, they're not yet um, uh, significantly updated, uh, but are going to summarize various outcome measures, like um, uh, how people's weight varies based on their distance from a grocery store, or... Um, uh, based on the ratio of distance from a convenience store to a grocery store um, uh, or uh, their preference for meals. How much does that matter or the, the distance from a park? So if we run this thing, um, and maybe it was a bad decision on my part, but um, uh, it will update these, um, uh, these graphs and we'll end up seeing some induced patterns uh, like we did yesterday with that nonlinear non pattern. Uh, we'll see something similar here in the fullness. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this is the fraction of meals. So each person is a point here. And the X location is the fraction of their meals that they've eaten at convenience stores. 
and the y location is their weight. And uh, generally speaking, the larger the fraction of the meals they eat at convenience stores, the higher their weight. Not in a fully linear way, but in a way that's sort of sublinear. Um, this is grocery store distance versus weight. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, obvious uh, obvious uh, associations there. This is grocery store to convenience store distance ratio. So if it's high, their grocery store is a lot further away than a the nearest the nearest grocery store is much further away than the nearest convenience store, and you'll notice that by and large this is a somewhat upward trend. We need to run it with a a larger set, um, but uh, larger population. But generally, if the grocery store is much further away than the the nearest grocery store is much further away than the nearest convenience store, um, they're going to tend to have higher weight. That's the Y value. Um, here's their preference for meals from a convenience store versus their weights. And this is the distance to a park compared to their weight. And you can see they're an association of sorts where if they're the further they are from the nearest park, the higher their weight tends to be. So this is a model which is using GIS information for quite a bit of, of, of information. Um, and you know, probably I should go back to this map down below uh, and just note that, um, uh, again, a set of these resources, the parks, the convenience stores, the, um, the grocery stores are all situated in, in geographic, like uh, correct geographic locations, um, except any ones we've added by interventions, by adding, geographically situated interventions, um, you know, placing grocery stores in food deserts or something like that. Um, by virtue of, of, of placing them, now we give people who might otherwise go to a convenience store to buy food, instead of going to a convenience store and buying Mars bars or whatever, uh, buying yellow, you know, um, uh, meat pies, they instead can go easily to a grocery store. And that may afford them healthier fare and thereby um, allow them to, to, to manage their weight more effectively, even for those quick bread and milk runs. Um, okay, so here, once again, we have emergent, uh, emergent patterns that are, uh, that are coming out of this model. Those emergent patterns are going to change as we, as we intervene. But this is a model that makes heavy use of locating things in space and then using routing data to calculate how far is it from a given person to the nearest grocery store or to the nearest convenience store for them and into the nearest park. So that information is used very strongly here in, um, in, in shaping their evolution. Okay. Um, and it induces these patterns uh, above in terms of the, the, the associations that we see. Okay, so this is a, a GIS model. It's a type of, it's a type of uh, continuous space, one that's not so stylized as, as real. Now, those models I, I highlighted in large part because they, they make heavy use of static resources. Uh, that last one is both static and dynamic. The people are dynamic, but there's parks, grocery stores, and uh, convenience stores that are all static. Beyond that, um, there's models that hinge around mobility. And mobility matters spatially. Mobility matters in some really interesting ways when it comes to the dynamics of models. It leads to broader circulation patterns, broader mixing patterns. But it can also lead to broader interactions with the environment, like picking a pathogen from work and bringing it home, right? Uh, it can accelerate the spread of infection. If I'm in a fixed location, maybe I'm breathing out aerosols and people in the front row can pick it up. And when they breathe out, people in the back row can pick it up or what have you. And it can spread. But if I'm mobile, I could walk you know, to the back row. I could walk beyond 
And I can actually carry you fentanyl with me in a way that accelerates diffusion, right? Um, and we've seen some of these things, um, like the environmental contamination one we, we examined earlier, where there are these pathogen reservoirs, right? That one this morning where we had clinics and people go to the nearest clinic to get treated um, and potentially find that clinic is, is very busy. Um, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, just one or two more. Um, one is a hierarchical infection transmission model. Um, and to see that, I will, I think, close this one. There's some, you know, after my interventions, there's some changes to the patterns, but we'll close that. I think we'll close all of these just for sanity's sake. And, um, and we'll say, no, okay. Um, so this hierarchical infection transmission is located <clears throat> Um, hierarchical, uh, excuse me, it's not in hyperbox, it's, it's, it's hierarchical infection transmission version 11, any logic eight. So it's in the main any logic eight resources, and I'm going to download it. Here we, here we go. Now, this model, um, is a hierarchical one. It's a multi-level one. Some of you may be familiar with multi-level statistical modeling, for example, where we have effects at perhaps a childhood level, a classroom level, a school level, and then a region. We might have some description of posited, um, uh, positive relationships statistically at each of those levels. So a classroom's learning might depend on the teacher in the classroom as well as individual students in the classroom's situation or characteristics. Then you might have effects of a school, um, uh, et cetera. Those are statistical methods um, that find associations. This is a hierarchical model that's a dynamic hierarchical model. So we have cities, shown in a stylized fashion as, as, as these uh, uh, squares. And we have individuals within networks, a distance-based network, if memory serves me, within these cities. Um, and those individuals, uh, by virtue of being in a network, a fairly dense one, can transmit infection to each other. And within this context of a hierarchical one, um, they're spread within a city by just simple uh, infection uh, across networks. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that's all fine, but we're going to see there's another way in which infection spreads. Maybe I'll spend just a word or two about this model. So here we have, this is, is worth noting. So we are up Maine. And in all our models thus far, what, where have people lived within Maine? Can anyone say? How did people relate to Maine? They were located in a what in Maine? Mm -hmm. Population of people. Here, there's no population of people in Maine. What is it? There's a population of what? Cities. Mm. That may give you pause. You know, we could double click on city. And city is not any old just container agent. No, 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 no. Um, city has a set of characteristics, a set of behaviors and actions. This relates to a question which Matthews asked not one hour events. So a city has a population size. Mm -hmm. It has a population of guess what? Persons. Persons. Each city does. And, and then it has an event 
that can go off and consider undertaking interventions depending on the observed level of infection within that city. So it fires off every week and public health considers whether the reported prevalence of infection, I say actually fractional prevalence, is greater than an intervention threshold. If so, I will intervene. And you may have noticed some of those squares turn color, like the outer part, that means they're being intervened upon. And then we go through each person in the population. We figure out if they're eligible for the population. If so, we perform the intervention of choice in the population. And, and then we record them as having been intervened upon. The really, so if anyone's looking for a model that's got some fun parts to it, it's a little bit further along their learning journey. I will just note that this is eligible, uh, excuse me, this, yes, is eligible for intervention. That's something defined by each scenario, what the rule is for, in, for someone being eligible for this intervention. Each scenario can have its own eligibility criteria. Um, perform intervention to person, that's also defined on a per scenario basis. So the scenario passes in information about its eligibility criteria and what scenario and what intervention to perform. And we can run different scenarios which involve different intervention criteria uh, for intervening upon people and different effects. There's a lot of fun there, but we're not, we're not, um, uh, we're not, uh, you know, gonna play in that sandbox right now. Um, but what I wanna signal is that each city has a, a population of people. Let's go down to the person level, if we may with your leave. Now, you'll notice the population level has a familiar state chart involving infection, right? Um, but there's something else beyond that that it has of great significance for infection spread. Oh, I should have emphasized, sorry. Cities are in connection with other cities. They're in a road network or a rail network. Um, you, you, they're, they're in some sort of rail network with other cities. Infection doesn't spread across that network, but people who well, move across that network should they choose to do so. And a person can periodically elect to move according to a migration rate. So here, a person gets their city, gets a random city connected to their city by a you know rail connection or flight connection or road connection or whatever and if there is such they go to that population they join that population instead and so they're knit into that network of that of that other city they they're woven into the fabric of the social fabric of that other city. Why do I say that's of great significance for spread of infection? Hmm? Why do I why do I say that? Why might that be of great significance? I'm running cities equal to ten. Let's see what that's like. Why, why would that be of great significance that they can migrate? What might they carry with them in so migrating? Infection. Incidentally, an interesting variant of this model is to ask what if their choice to migrate were based on the risk perception in their current city, right? They choose to move to another city because people are starting to get infected in their in the current city. And people sought to look at this uh, mathematically, but there's actually some really interesting um, studies that can be done dynamically. So people are moving between these cities, and only one city starts with a seated infection. But now you notice two cities are in lockdown, have this intervention applied, or whatever the intervention is. How did, how did it jump from one city to another? Anyone want to pause it, I guess? Hmm? 
how would it have jumped? Migration. Someone brought brought it, you know. Um, typhoid Mary or what have you, you know, brings it to this other city. It's now spreading in that city. Person, person. And some of those people can then go to another city, right? Um, this is the danger. And hop between cities, it does. Um, and it's not that, again, cities transmit to other cities directly, but rather they, the, the people move by that. And so we could examine the effects of an intervention here that might prevent people from moving between cities, right? And I think actually in 2020, in January 2020, Wuhan and, and Hunan tried exactly that. They tried to restrict movement, right? But there were some people who fled to further provinces in the meantime, and some of them actually carried the infection with them to these other provinces. So this, this is not you know purely based on arbitrary speculation. There are, there are well-documented cases of this. Um, in fact, there was a, what was it, Lao Nai Nai, um, uh, Lao Tai Tai, um, who, who was found, remember she was playing Mahjong in that other city? Yeah, yeah, and she she used someone else's, uh, someone else's WeChat to signal when she went, remember that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, anyway, um, so, uh, so here, ladies and gentlemen, mobility matters. We have we have space here that's stylized, right? Locations or, or these broad cities, but mobility is key for the spread of infection. And uh, and you get these dual processes of contagion, as it were. One, spread of infection within a city, and two, spread of infection between cities by physical mobility okay um so that's that's an interesting one it's it's also notable in the sense that each city institutes has these processes going on it, it's not passive it has these processes going on it can declare an intervention it can apply that intervention and it can declare it based on the observed conditions yeah okay um so that's a uh, heroic model. Now, time is short here. Um, uh, let's let's just uh, talk uh, a little bit about motivations for this. Uh, we've seen a bunch of these models. There's a classic one, the Schelling segregation model, which depicts the emergence from very simple factors um, of segregation, um, resulting from even very modest preferences to live near people like you, you get these broad spatial patterns of segregation. In no way programmed into the model, but they're emergent properties that emerge from each agent's decision-making process just applied writ large across many, many agents that leads to these broad patterns, high-level patterns of orderliness in the form of segregation. That model is very simple rules. There's no residential steering. There's no predatory lending practices. There's no, you know, um, neglect by real estate agents. It's just these slight preferences added up again and again and again and again lead to segregated patterns in a way that's, you know, uh, can be distressing. Um, so, de facto versus de jure. What's that? De facto versus de jure. That, that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's not imposed by legal structures, but it emerges from um, from from uh, you know a confluence uh, writ large of many many preferences. So you know why why have spatial embedding in a model? Uh, wait, another blank. Um, locality perception. My perception might be limited by my um by my uh, uh by 
where I am in space, right? Um, my influence might be limited to air, nearby areas of space. Transmission is common limited. Maybe it's transmission of norms through, through imitative behavior. Bullying might take place, much of it, among small kids, you know, uh, in a in, in a spatially localized way. Um, some spread of um, of of attitudes might occur, uh, but lo um, located uh, uh, proximately. And social determinants of health, right? My characteristics of my neighborhood: the crime rates, the pollution levels, the walkability, the sidewalk, sidewalk state, um, availability of sidewalks, availability of green space. These influence my options and my ability to engage in physical activity. The food environment locally influences my eating patterns, right? Um, sometimes, though, we're interested in spatial behavior over that space, like walking, green space use, etc. Sometimes we're interested in Spatial phenomena, like spread within the space, between cities, like in that latest model. The concentration of prions in certain areas of the space, the buildup in certain pathogen or in reservoirs of pathogen. And we want to capture, you know, spatial clustering, for example, in that. Um, or maybe you want to understand how interventions that you want to undertake may be diluted in some areas and stronger in others because of the physical nature of the environment. Um, you're interested in understanding their urban effects, but also their rural effects. Uh, you know, effects on the east side versus the west side of Saskatoon or for certain types of, uh, certain types of interventions. I will say one thing. And you may not consider this, you know, a, a deep philosophical recommendation, but I'm just telling you something about human psychology. If I show people an agent-based model, um, the most powerful thing I can do to get them to understand what an agent-based model is, and, you know, a, 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 a stakeholder, a, a decision maker, a potential client, whatever, for modeling, the most powerful thing I can do is show them a geographic depiction of agents circled in the geographic space. Because they recognize their own. They recognize their world. They say, oh, that, that agent, oh yeah, it's moving around Saskatoon. Okay, it's encountering these resources. It's engaging with, you know, so be on 8th or, or it's it's going to you know Kinsman Park or 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 uh, to the exhibition or the X or what have you. Um and and there's something that speaks to people geographically that opens them to this idea that like a model could could um, be useful by looking at the, at situated agents. If you just talk with them at a high level about the model, their eyes will glaze over. But if you show them something geographically, gives them something to hang on to, a beachhead for understanding. Oh, it's an individual going around town, interacting with resources and interacting with others. And it's very powerful psychologically. Do I have a good reason for it? Do I have a good understanding? Absolutely not. Um, it, 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 it is something that perhaps psychologists who study boundary objects and study people's interactions with technology would understand. Perhaps people in human-computer interaction might explore this. But I tell you, I've noticed nothing more powerful. It's not a surefire thing, but it, no it opens doors that might otherwise be shut, to quote Peter Gabriel. Um, and... Uh, and a final thing I'll, I'll note about spatial embedding, often it, dry, it, it can drive um, network formation, right? So there are spatial phenomena. There are, there are phenomena over space that, 
that may also be over networks, but may just be in nearby areas of space um, that, that are patterns of emergence. And agent-based modeling um, is distinguished compared to system dynamics or discrete event modeling and allow us to probe spatial structures. And, you know, um, if we look at the data, right, um, with, uh, uh, with models and, um, uh, and the use of uh, dynamic models, you may remember back to Monday, uh, where we had, uh, we had uh, patterns of, what is that people coming up? Um, we had, you know, some spatial patterns, right? You know, sometimes they show a slide of what's going on there? Like what's happening? Why is that coming up? Can anyone say? You move your mouse faster. I'm... Seriously. Oh. What a shock. You mouse over that icon yes. in the bottom left. Yes. This thing? Oh. oh my gosh. How do I out of black spot? How do I get rid of this? Welcome to Windows 11. <laughs> <laughs> Personalize my feed. How about I like don't feed? <laughs> Apparently you can't not feed. That, that sounds like a pate de foie gras or something like force fed goose. Um, it's horrible, it's horrible. Um, so spatial disparities are important, and um, and you know we're often interested in them as as uh, emergent phenomena, and spatial models can provide us ways of of, of looking uh, here. Right? Um, uh, I will say mobile interventions are another thing, right? Door-to-door -door screening. That was something, Wade, I think you were involved in for Lalash during the pandemic. You know, having screeners go door-to-door -door within a community um, to talk, uh, to, to, to help with testing, help um, make sure people have access to masks, uh, get, if, if anyone's sick, get them into cohort, into housing, um, uh, whereby they don't have to expose their family, they can be supported by a caregiver, but they're, you know, safely sequestered away in these crowded households. Um, uh, you know, take them out of the crowded household and 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 put them put them in. We can look at the impacts of limited spatial mobility, like moving between cities or going to work and back and carrying infection. Um, right. Um, yeah, so both space and networks capture aspects of context. Uh, sometimes they're tangled together. Uh, often things motivate one, motivate the other. Um, sometimes one of them is more recommended in a given case. Sometimes we have space without networks. Um, that example of a, a food, food based intervention was one of those. Sometimes we have networks with nothing more than, you know, convenience, sort of visual space, but it's nothing. Um, nothing profound. Um, and I will say, though, that spatial movement sometimes drives network dynamics, and some models um, include both. Um, here's some uses of geographic information. I'm not going to go through them, but I'll put them you know, on the slides for, for reference. And I'll just say any logic has quite good basic support for, for, G, for continuous Embedding, um, basic support for continuous embedding. You can move people around. And if people are interested in seeing how that's done, how I say this agent move to this other agent, or that, so this agent can say, find the agents of a certain sort, a, a primary care physician, a, a, a STI clinic, a school, or whatever, within a certain radius. I'm glad to, to show that in a later session. Um, GIS is supported at a at a decent basic level. We can build up some you know decent ones, but it has uh, less less I know it had um, really limited support for things like shape files. Um, it's you know a basic level. You can get routing information and route people around and have different modes of transport 
and situate agents at different places. It's quite quite slick for the basic needs, but it runs into to limits if you want to bring in custom GIS databases without some program. Without some program. So if you if you can involve some someone to have program it, um, you're fine. Um, uh, discrete cells are also reasonably well supported, although I can you know quibble with certain aspects of that. Uh, aspects of that situation. Um, yeah. Um, right. So uh, mobility matters. I, I mentioned it, and um, you know, there's reasons. Yeah. I, I think I'll stop there. Um, okay. Um, so those are some comments on spatial models. Um, we have many spatial models that we've included in the examples. Um, I think they're a very important class of models and one that plays to the strengths of agent-based modeling in delivering value in the health sphere. Um, uh, they play a role in healthcare, considered the spatial, the trauma center, and other spatially situated embodiments of discrete event simulation where placement of resources is important or considered in a purely agent context. Space is really, really a rich environment, agent-agent interaction, agent-environment interaction, like polluting the environment, agent-environment-agent interaction, picking up things from the environment, being a shape by resources around in the environment or nearness of resources, moving between places and exposing different parties or being exposed. All these are really rich aspects. We leave open lots of opportunities for, for rich interactions and models. But that's all we have time for for the basics here. Hope that uh, exposes you to you know some considerations when it comes to um, thinking about space. Needless to say, if there's a request for tomorrow for more details on X, just let me know and and I can show you more models or show how how some basics of how they're built or what have you. So thanks so much. I think we will break now for the day and we will use the time here for incubator projects. Okay, thank you very much. We will see people tomorrow morning at 8.30. Okay, thank you. And I'll try to post those, those uh, slides. Thanks very much.